computer. There you go. We should have it. Yeah. Okay. And a good evening to all of you. Coffee with Kruger. We are ready to begin with prayer. So let's start. Heavenly Father, we once again come to you as searching your scripture for answers uh, to the wonderful truths of our salvation. And as we take a look at the some of the things that we have concerns about or things we don't fully understand to give us clarity by yes. the power of your spirit. We just ask, Lord, to be with us during this time of study in Jesus' name. In Jesus Amen. Name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, everybody. And tonight we're going to be looking at a couple of topics. Uh, the first one that uh, John uh, requested that we discuss uh, last week he just asked this was does god repent does god make change his mind uh is that does that categorize it pretty well john oh uh, uh well yes it does uh, um did he have regrets well, was one of the things i think there was a passage in the bible somewhere he said i regret making mankind or something like that i'm not sure so he regrets he repents he grieves yeah. there's all kinds of emotion emotional attributes that the bible uses to convey um how we finite human beings would describe an infinite god who's beyond time and space and um, maybe different for him but that's how he is viewed. So let me let me go through what what I have looked at, and then we can discuss it a little bit. And then we'd like to go on for the second half of the half hour and discuss the uh, a little more fully uh, purgatory and how that came to be because we did not really flesh that out too well last time. So that'll take up our five minutes together, uh, thirty minutes together. <laughs> I don't know how we do this stuff on 30 minutes, but in Malachi chapter three, verse six, uh, it says, uh, it says this, I, the Lord do not change. So you descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. He doesn't change. So his followers don't have to worry about him changing his mind. And then the book of James in chapter one, verse 17 says every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Mm -hmm. And then in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 23, 19, says God is not a man that he should lie, nor son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill. So the Bible says God does not change. God is unchanging. That's one of the wonderful attributes. Somebody, if he weren't unchanging, then the plan of salvation that was good a hundred years ago, maybe he changed his mind after the, after the pandemic, who knows? But no, God doesn't change his mind. He is also <laughs> all wise. So he cannot change his mind since he already knows all things in the sense of realizing a mistake or backtracking or saying he's he made a mistake trying a new tack. So then how do we explain some of the verses that uh, John was concerned about last week? Uh, one, which we've spent some time on, John, Genesis 6, 6, the flood. Or the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. He almost repented of doing it. And Exodus 32, 14 says that. It says, then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And then um, another passage that's often used, which we looked at in at, at Trinity sometime back in our sermon series on Jonah, uh, Jonah, the prophet, you know, was sent out to tell the people to repent, Nineveh to repent. And if they didn't repent, the Lord had promised that in 40 days there would be nuked, right? 
they would be toast in 40 days. The judge, judgment would be on them. And so he says, 40 days, uh, you're going to die. 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Well, they repented. And the Lord recanted. He repented of the judgment and did not have, uh, had, he had compassion and didn't bring the destruction that he had threatened. So in all of this, then there are two considerations. Uh, first of all, we can say statements that the Lord was, was grieved. Uh, the Lord um, uh, repented. The Lord sorrowful. These are examples of something that's called anthropomorphism. And anthropomorphism is a figure of speech ascribed to the infinite God, a way of helping us understand God's work from a human perspective. So in Genesis 6, 6, we understand God was really upset and sorrowful over mankind's sin. God obviously did not reverse his decision to create man. In fact, we're alive today as proof that he didn't. But uh, he was, it says that he was very sorrowful over it. Second, we have to make a distinction between conditional declarations of God and unconditional declarations of God. So, um, when God said, I will destroy Nineveh in 40 days, was that a conditional or an unconditional one? Conditional. Conditional. Conditional upon Nineveh's response. We know that because when the Assyrians repented, God didn't yes. bring the judgment. God didn't change his mind. Rather, his message to Nineveh was a warning meant to provoke to bring about repentance mm -hmm. and his warning was successful much to the chagrin of Jonah the chagrin. The example of an unconditional declaration of God is the Lord's promise to David and to us uh, in 2nd Samuel 7 it says your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me and your throne speaking about the, the kingdom of the coming of the Messiah will be established forever that's unconditional. It's not conditioned upon how good we are or how bad we are. God is going to do it no matter what. So um, this is outlined for us. This, this, this hermeneutic principle is outlined for us in Jeremiah chapter 18, where the Lord himself explains it to us. And this is most helpful to me. Jeremiah 18 says, if at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I have planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I intended to do for it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah, those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I'm preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. So note the conditional word in there. That's if. If the nation I warned repents, I'll relent. If they don't, then all bets are off. So that's what he's saying. So the bottom line really in looking at this particular question is that God ends up being in, throughout scripture entirely consistent uh, in his holiness. He will judge sin. That never changes. However, he always is aware and accepts repentance and changed ways. And so in his holiness, he has mercy on Nineveh and spares them. The change of mind is consistent with his character in being both holy, just, and loving. So the, the fact that God changes his treatment of us in response to, to how we are, it just tells the same thing. The soul that sins shall die. 
we're headed to hell in a handbasket from the moment of our conception on because of original sin. And yet, the moment we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that completely changes. Now we are his children. And there's a whole different view on it. And he is uh, merciful to us. And so um, that's pretty much what I would have to say regarding uh, that topic. Do you have any questions or comments on that? Talking about, does God change his mind? I have, a I have a question that came to my mind when you were talking about this. Uh, when God is dealing with a situation, what to do. Uh, but I was, I was thinking in terms of, of, of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because he, when he prayed, he was under such distress that his perspiration had blood in it. As he contemplated uh, whether to go through and carry out the cross. Of course, he did that. That was the will of the Father. But there was a real temptation there for him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it a sin to be tempted? No. no. What's well, I, I, I think a temptation can come. The question is, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's your response? Jesus was tempted like everyone else. Yeah. It's what it's the coming to the temptation. That's the sin. Okay, very good, Greg. Greg Young, good to have you with us again. Thank you. Anything else on this topic of the, the mind of God? John, is that, are you, are you okay with that? Or do you still have, want to oh, go No, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, because it, it really does, uh, well, you did explain uh, what I had as a question in my own mind about him um, uh, questioning things, but being just and uh, merciful too. Merciful. So, um, yeah, he he will listen to uh, the people who change, and that's uh, that's good to know. Well, we this this whole idea of anthropomorphism, you know, you see it all all over Scripture where the Bible looks at God as though he were a, he had, had human characteristics, uh, emotions, and so forth. And that's for our good. He's doing it to help us understand what we can't understand. And the final analysis is there's never a place in the Bible where God is ever wishy-washy about our salvation. That never changes. What does change is his judgment. Whenever there is a change, it's a change because uh, he doesn't want to judge. He wants to forgive. And yet he's holy, so he has to punish sin. Yet he's also loving, so he doesn't want to punish the sinner. So how is he going to balance the two, uh, his justice and his love? The way he did it uh, was to find a way himself to take that sin on himself mm -hmm. so it would be in, the righteousness of God would be imputed, put onto us, and we would be considered sinless in the sight of the <clears throat> And that is the, the, the big um, exchange. Luther said the great exchange that happened uh, on the cross. And we'll talk more about that during Lent, I'm sure. Uh, I, I just have one more comment, if you don't mind. Uh, and that is, you were talking about the anthropomorphic, what was the word, uh, the pronunciation? Anthropomorphism? <laughs> yeah, 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 of, of God. Did you get that at the seminary, Greg? Yeah, well, they did, but I just couldn't pronounce it. <laughs> I'm familiar with it. It's God being God, man. God. But is there a danger uh, when we come to worship with... Uh, in the age that we live, that people are approaching God more as a man than as God, that they're getting confused by that, and they're not seeing the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the, the God where we take our shoes off when we approach him. What do the rest of you think about that thought? True. It's almost, I agree with him. Yeah. 100%. Uh, well, what, what do you mean by you agree with it? I, I, 
uh, maybe I misunderstood him, but I I see, I think that we as a culture don't um, recognize the His greatness holiness. of God, the perfectness of God, the holiness of God, yeah. or the justice. Yeah. Uh, we only want to see um, how he's merciful and how he's uh, loving. He's just loving. And that's, we, you know, we have this little tiny picture of God instead of the awesome, um, all-powerful, all-wise one that he is. Some of you have been in uh, the church, Christianity, for more than 40, 30, 40 years. Have you noticed a change uh, ver versus the um, holiness of God, the other worldliness of God, and the kind of um, a very close, touchy-feely, Jesus is good to everybody kind of God? Yes. You have, yeah. Can you explain that to me, what you've noticed? I've noticed that, that uh, we don't want to hear anything about um, the judgment. We don't hear much about the judgment. We don't hear about um, uh, actually not a whole lot about sin. It, we, we, we do talk, we acknowledge it, and we confess it. But I don't think we um, realize our sin is offense, an offense to God. It's we think of it, well, I wasn't kind to somebody or I told a lie or something like that. But it, we we don't put God into the picture. We don't allow him because any sinfulness we have is, um, first of all, uh, a rejection of or an affront or a turning away from God. Sometimes I think when we have the invocation in the beginning of the worship we need to and i'm not saying we don't do it but focus on the fact that we are invoking the presence of almighty god in our sanctuary to dwell among his people and that is a holy thing and it shouldn't be as if we look at jesus as he's my brother and i got my arm around him and i go talk to him and this you know th there's some truth to that but we forget that who God is, you know, looking back in the Old Testament, I'm always reminded that the people couldn't go up to the mountain and they had certain regulations going into the tabernacle or into the temple. However, with uh, Peter, James and John, they were on transfiguration, did go up into the cloud because they were with Jesus who made, you know, that was part of it. But I think sometimes we're, we're forgetting the holiness and the awesomeness of God in worship. And that is a, a scary thing to me. You know, maybe we need to have a, a few more prophets running around Marin County. <laughs> uh, that, that, the, uh, that judgment is... Well, not I'm, not, I'm not talking about judgment. I'm just talking about knowing holiness. that God is God. The holiness of God. Take your of shoes course. off. This is holy yeah. ground. Well, something to think about. Have we watered that down a little bit in our culture today? There Have is we taken balance. that away? Good, good. Yeah. Thank you. So, good balance. Anybody else? So, Ed, you just kind of remind me of my trip to the Danube, um, or as the last commenter was. You know, you can't even go into some of these, you know, 1,500-year-old, 2,000-year-old churches. Um they're all kind of subterranean. There's no light. The only light is candlelight. Uh, there are these icons uh -huh. on the walls. And what struck me is that you have to go down bended. You have to bend to God. You have to bend to Jesus. You can't uh -huh. walk in there like we do, you know, head up high and, you know, expect, you know, light, you know, light is, everything's there. You, you literally have to stoop to get in the to get in the stairway and get into the into the sanctuary it's uh you know i just kind of i i kind of i, I said once again if i look at it you know i think about it is a lot of time we spend our time thinking about you know how do we make the church uh you know our sanctuary more welcoming to get more people in there get more more butts in the seats uh and then at the same time you know aren't we really supposed to be thinking about, you know, bending to what God wants? 
Well, when we were when I was in Pomona as pastor, there was a Baptist church next to me that offered elephant rides. <laughs> How could elephant you beat that? Rides. How could it's an you attraction beat the to get them rides. to come to church? <laughs> what rides? What rides did you say? Elephant rides. Elephant rides. <laughs> Maybe we could use Davidson. The big yeah, just, like, just like Dale Teeth, he, he still wears his tennis shoes when he lights the candles on Sunday. Yeah. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. No, he okay. doesn't. Kids One thing do that tennis I, shoes. Okay. I think also in our culture, the, the name of God isn't respected. I mean, a lot of the songs, they actually say, oh, my God. And they don't mean it as a prayer. They just say it like, wow, or something like that. And so um, that, that to me is just like, ah, I hate that because it's not respecting the name of God. And that just, mm. yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, when you had that near death experience, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, are you comfortable talking a little bit if I ask you a question about it? Okay. That you, how, how, what, what age were you? I was five. And um, did you see a light? Mm -hmm. What was the yeah. light like? It's kind of indescribable, but it was brighter than anything you can imagine. But it was also, um, it was like a, like a tunnel sort of thing. So um, it definitely had order, but yeah. So anyway, it's, it's hard to describe it. It's just... It's, it, it is more real than this dimension that we're in now. It's like when you turn on the light and then the, all the darkness is gone. I'm thinking about you because I'm preparing for my Sunday message that is for Transfiguration Sunday where Jesus mm -hmm. takes his skin off and it glows, just becomes completely mm -hmm. light. And you got to see a little of that. A little bit. <laughs> and yeah, I didn't see the full face, but probably. But you saw some of it. And it, it's an interesting thing. Those of, who've had encounters where heaven was very close and they've described things like that. But uh, it has nothing to do with what we were talking about <laughs> before. But um, it is a part of the holiness of God that we do want to keep in mind and have a balance where people. Uh, can feel comfortable being receiving the message of Jesus and yet understanding the grandeur of an almighty God that's there, that they're approaching at the same time that maybe they never knew before. Uh, and I think as the person becomes converted, they sense the whole power of the spirit and they get a feel for that grandeur, that the, the light, somehow somebody was able to completely change them like being reborn. Myrna, did you have that experience? No, my daughter did though. She she's 42 in April, so this happened when she was 4. She um she was practicing at home and she happened to fall on a glass that was on the coffee table and I was I had just taken the other glasses and it sliced her neck right open and she had to have, be in surgery but she had an, uh, she, they operated on her for about eight hours at Seton. And, and this was like 1986. And uh, she says that she was out of her body watching the doctors operate on her. And she was four. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So we, and then we, three days later, because of all the steroids, because they had to read, uh, they had to reconstruct uh, her trachea. She had to have a tracheotomy at UCSF, even all this before kindergarten. Uh, that's something. Well, moving back then to our discussion of the character of God, uh, he doesn't change his mind, but the Bible does ascribe him emotions. And so when we're made in the image of God, that means we are given emotions. And for us to be aware of our emotions and know that it comes from God, including the grief process and everything else. I mean, God grieved. 
Jesus grieved over Jerusalem. It's part of uh, what God does because he feels things. And, and it's not the way we do, but the Bible describes it like that because it's the only way we can understand it. Um, Peg, you've got your hand up. Very good, Peg. Well, thank you. Um, I have a question in terms, of, this is back about two conversations ago. I'm sorry, I'm, my mind is behind today. But when you, if in the Greek, if you, or I guess you studied the Bible in Greek, right? So when you translate, this goes back to what Celeste was talking about, the fear of God. And we were talking about respect of God, whatever. How does the word fear of God translate in the Greek? Is it fear like us, it's fearful, like, you know, scary, whatever, or is it a more respect? <clears throat> Thank you for asking that question. And uh, I'll have um, our Greek scholar, Greg Young, answer that one for us. <laughs> I have to look into that. But, you're, you know, you have to look at the Hebrew word in the Old Testament because there's more passages about the fear of God there. Okay, I'll take Probably Hebrew. in the early <laughs> books than anywhere else. So, yeah. And I don't have all my collection because I left it at the church. So Pastor Ed might have much more at his house. <laughs> All of mine's on the computer. Greg, <laughs> yeah, you, mentioned, okay. you mentioned that it was in the Old Testament. Well, the fear of God, I'm thinking like uh, when uh, God was on Mount Sinai and, and the people couldn't go up. And if they did, they would be struck down. And uh, also the fear of God uh, when they carried the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, mm -hmm. one of the individuals uh, stumbled and somebody tried to grab it. And he was struck down by by disobeying, even though he's trying to protect the ark. But uh, his motives were good, but he disobeyed God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess sometimes the question is too, will those people who did that be in heaven? I would think so. I would hope so. But, that individual. That, yeah, and that gets into sort of the difference between law and gospel in, in my mind. It's like right, yeah. the and, law was uh, full of lots of or is full, still is full of lots of fearful kinds of things that we have to obey. And we realize as humans, we cannot, we cannot even hope to uh, uh, attain well, that I, level of. Could we say <laughs> though that the children of Israel, the children of Israel stumbled many times because they did not fear God the way they should have? They went after other idols. They did not respect God. They did not listen to the prophets and uh, to the warnings. And they just continued to do what they wanted to do. And in the end, you know, everything backfired on them. But isn't that where our society and our world is today? Yep. So I would say yes. <laughs> well, that was my concern. Uh, Genesis 9, 2 says, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast. So the fear... This is not the fear of God, but it, uh, the Hebrew word is mora, uh, which um, means uh, terror, reverence, mm -hmm. object of reverence, awe-inspiring spectacle. And in the case of the fear of God, usually the po point B, reverence, or object of reverence, is the one that we think of most often. So God doesn't want us, when we should fear and love God, that we do not, you know, disobey God. It's not that we should be afraid of him, but that we should respect him. Mm -hmm. When we come to church, what we want to teach our children is this is a place where you almost take off your shoes and walk in with reverence. And you, you understand you are in God's space uh, and with the word and the sacrament and the assembly of God and that you uh, recognize that he is someone to be worshiped, not uh, trifled over. And yet well, on the other hand, he's a, a God that's very close to us and loves us um, just yeah. as we are. For sure. Okay. Well, you know, so much for purgatory. <laughs> is that I next Wednesday? <laughs> uh, we'll yeah. we'll uh, look at that in a couple of weeks. Next week, we'll be having an Ash Wednesday. Oh, Ashes wow. with Kruger and next Valentine's. Wednesday. Same day. Yes. Valentine's and Ash Wednesday. We have a lot of things wow. going on. We'll 
Look forward to seeing many of you either live or online Sunday uh, for a Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday. And then uh, Ash Wednesday, we'll have a worship time here at 630 and in the morning at the church with the youth at Trinity. And um, I think that's it for tonight. Let's close with a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for helping us see through scripture uh, your true nature of being loving and merciful and kind. And all of that is because your justice has been meted out and has been taken care of through the uh, sacrificial death of your son, Jesus Christ. Yes. Thank you for that. And we celebrate that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, have a great evening thank in the Lord, and we'll thank you. Thank you very much. You, thank, thank you. you.